Hi, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today, what will it take to bring resolution to the disputed Western Sahara? We're about to take an in-depth look. I didn't always tell you about the preparations we put a show together, but this week it's been fascinating. There are some guests who say they won't even come on the show because they're worried for their safety. That's an interesting aspect of this story. So that's offline, online, intense, Omar Bada. What's really going on? It has been quite intense. And a lot of people with strong opinions. And frankly, many people actually agree that the people of Western Sahara are suffering, but there are people pointing fingers in different directions. So you have Habibullah over here who says Morocco is illegally exploiting Sahrawi natural resources and uses those resources to, to sponsor its open air prison in occupied Western Sahara. On the other hand, Sahara Watch says it is Algeria that has transformed the Tindouf refugee camps for Western Saharans into a big prison where people are deprived of the most basic necessities of life. Now, we're going to try to sort through all of that and figure out what exactly happening. But in the meantime, folks at home, tweet us. The hashtag is AJStream, and we'll get to those tweets during the show. Right here with us in the studio, we have Samia el -Razuki. She's the co-editor of Jadalia and also a freelance writer. Samia, welcome. Thank you so much. We are so going to be picking your brain in just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Sit tight. We won't be, we'll be back in a minute. Sure. Hi, my name is Harsh Gupta. I'm a public policy columnist, and I am in the stream. For more than 40 years, Western Sahara has been under dispute. A Spanish colony until 1975, its map reflects its complicated story. Resource-rich territory in the north and along the western coastline are under Morocco's control. Across a dividing line known as the Berm, land to the east is under the control of the armed Polisario Front, which wants an independent and free state. And in neighboring Algeria's Tindouf province, around 150,000 Sarari refugees are living in camps. This is also the seat of the self-appointed Sarari Arab Democratic Republic, who's calling for a sovereign Western Sahara. This region was entrenched in guerrilla war until the United Nations brokered a ceasefire back in 1991. But that referendum, which was meant to follow, never actually happened. Earlier this month, the Moroccan government said that they wouldn't offer any more than autonomy to Western Sahara. The United Nations Secretary General has recently called for true negotiations to end the deadlock, and his special envoy, Christopher Ross, is currently visiting the region. Claims of human rights abuses and growing extremism are adding to the concerns of the international community over this disputed area. So in a nutshell, Morocco lays claim to Western Sahara, as Sarari say, this is our land. Here to help us talk more about this, in Rabat, Morocco, Ali Leyazi is a member of parliament for the Socialist Union for Popular Forces Party and also a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Moroccan Parliament. Also with us from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Senia Bashir Abdurrahman is a Sarari refugee activist. And in Rabat, Morocco, Roussine El Amadi is professor at Qadi Ayad University. It's good to have you here, everybody. Uh, let me just go back to that map. Uh, Ali, have a look at this map here for me. It's here on my laptop. So on this map, we've got Morocco, Algeria, Mauritania. This area here, who owns it? Who does it belong to? Well, basically, you're pointing at the southern province of uh, Morocco. Right. But uh, we considered the land that was occupied by the Spanish uh, occupant up uh, till 1975 for most of it. Right. So it's basically it's uh, this uh, what we call here the southern provinces. So the southern provinces. Of the southern region of Morocco. Uh, Senia. Yes, indeed. Senia, th that same area, the yellow area that I was pointing to, who does that belong to? That's the occupied territories of Western Sahara, Africa's last colony, and it has been under Moroccan uh, occupation since 75. So that's where half of the population still live under Moroccan oh. oppressive regime and uh, occupying authoritarian regime. Professor of History, Professor Massine, uh, this area here? Yeah, this is pure propaganda. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the zone you are showing on your map is definitely a Moroccan zone. And uh, uh, it belongs to Morocco since uh, ever, and the history is here to witness uh, the, the, the rightness of the Moroccan 
spoken in Parliament. Wow, one map, so many answers. Um, Samia, can I just ask you, just to make sure we've, we've asked every single person, and then Omar also has a response mm -hmm. too. Go ahead, Samia. Of course, I mean, if we're looking at the United Nations, it's a non self -governing, governing territory, so mm -hmm. it doesn't belong to anyone. In, in fact, it actually belongs to Spain. Spain still has legal authority over. Is this what you believe? So technically, Spain has the responsibility in terms of seeking a resolution in the conflict, and they're the last ones to have official legal control over the Western mm. Saharan territory. Morocco's control over the Western Sahara is de facto. Spain's is de jure. All right. So there's the question of so who does it belong to, and then there's also the issue of what life is like there. I'm going to come to you in just a little bit. But Sammy, I wanted to follow up with you about what life is like. We have uh, Noama over here who says, my family lives in the territory and tells me wonders about how life is great under Moroccan rule. On the other hand, you have Mohammed Salem says Sahrawis in the occupied territory are denied their right to protest, general assembly, and freedom of expression. Which of these two is more accurate look at what life is like there? I mean, the amount of resources that are being expended in the Western Saharan territories are meant to sort of enrich life and create the conditions whereby there would be incentives to draw back refugees. I mean, the case of refugees in Morocco is very, it's very unique. Refugees are actually invited to come back, but refugees who have decided to stay in the refugee camps in Tindouf have done so based off of a political decision um, until self-determination has been achieved. On the other hand, there are parts in Morocco, parts in the rural areas of Morocco that are deprived of the most basic infrastructure. So both of them, I mean, we're, we're touching on an issue that, that looks at, it's, it's just not, it's across the board in Morocco, there are situations that, um, that are just, yeah, it's unfortunate that refugees in, uh, in, in Morocco are unable to, yeah. Let me just bring in Ali. Ali, what were you gonna say? Go ahead. No, I was gonna say, it's very dangerous to say that uh, it's for Spain to claim their land. It's basically taking the world back 50 years ago when we were all just, uh, you know, the savages. And, uh, you know, you have the big powers, the European uh, countries that are running and deciding who owns what. Uh, I'm saying that um, this is very dangerous to go back to this Frankist. We're not in the Franco's time anymore. We have to recognize that there is countries that are independent and they are building their countries. And uh, we should not go back to, uh, to this time. At the same time, uh, Morocco has never claimed to be um, a rich country that can solve all the social problems in, in its territories. That's for sure. We have issues in the north as well as in the south. But again, when you look at the situation but in La Ayoun or in Dakhla, it's much, much more advanced than it was in 1975. On the other hand, but do they... what happened in the Tindouf camp last couple of weeks when with 20 millimeters of rain, showed that actually our uh, brothers, the refugees in, uh, in the camps are suffering. Algeria is maintaining them in so, so Ali, I, I'm just going to really, really, I'm really jump in bad a, a, a little bit to explain that. Otherwise, we cannot accept. All right, so I'm, I'm just going to explain is... a, a little bit that across the border from Western Sahara, uh, a line of, of refugee camps and those line of refugee camps. No, no, no. Yeah, the, the map ahead. you showed is not correct. The map you showed is not correct. The, the, you showed the part that this is, this is a UN map. So, so uh, Ali, for, forgive the UN, yes. UN map. Let's talk the about UN what's happening on the. The UN does not recognize uh, that so part to be owned right. by the anybody else. Absolutely, and you also the said camps, that you believed it to be southern. The are in Algeria. Yes, you exactly. Have to be clear that's, about that's what I said. I know if you'd allow me to finish the sentence, I would have actually said oh, across the border in Algeria, we will find the refugee camps. Ali, you okay with that? All right, phew. All right, I agree. All right. The camps are in Algeria. In. As long as All we're right. clear on that, I'm good. Yes, I, I, if you'd allow me to finish the sentence, I would have got there. Now I sure. have. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. All right. Can you, Sen can Sen you, you, you were born there. To... Right. Go, go ahead. Tell, tell us about the refugee camps and, and how they came about. No, first, just uh, let me go back to your early question about yeah. uh, how is the situation in uh, in the occupied territories of Western Sahara, because the, the discussion derailed, unfortunately, from that. Uh, you see the occupied territories of Western Sahara, where still uh, hundreds of thousands of Sahrawis still live and continue to express uh, serious human rights violations. These are witnessed by friends that are very close and family members. Can that you explain are there. what you We're mean by that? Be specific. 
Yeah, we're talking about young people who, if they protest in the streets, my friend, for instance, she was a student in Marrakesh, and she was severely beaten that she lost her eye. And today she has to to, to, to have a fake eye. And the other one, unfortunately, was beaten so so brutally no, I really in uh, Jam'a Lifna, under, under the smell, where, where, where tourists I mean, uh, you know, are listening to. Uh, and professor, just, and just, just, just allow Senia to finish her sentence. Before. Professor, allow Senia to finish her sentence, and then I'll, I'll bring you right in. Ali, just give me give me a pause for a moment. Senia, finish your sentence. Yes, uh, my uh, my my very good friend. Uh, she was a student in 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 Marrakesh. Her name is Rabab. She was be severely be beaten in Jam Alifna, where tourists, you know, go in Marrakesh, and um, and okay. she had to unfortunately seek asylum in Sweden. Um, and uh, right, so, and that, these so those are, are the examples uh, of what you said. These are documented out. by Amnesty International, Human right. Rights Watch, RFK, you know, reputable organizations that unfortunately. So, Sonia, let, let me just bring in Professor because he, he's not happy with what you're saying. Professor, go ahead. Of course, I disagree completely with what she, uh, she said because I'm a professor at Qadi Iyad University in Marrakesh and I know very well the city, I know very well the location and know uh, very well the movements that are uh, struggling over the, uh, I mean, uh, um, the Marrakesh city. So uh, to say that Morocco is beating or is uh, preventing the Sahara people to express their mind is not true. This is false because the Sahrawi people at the University of Qadi Iyad are just expressing their mind as a minority, trying to explain their, uh, I mean, their their, their point of view. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have other movements that are claiming that these parts of uh, Morocco should uh, regain Moroccan monarchy and stay in the uh, in the kingdom as a part uh -huh. of uh, Morocco and the um, um, the Moroccan. Uh, population. All right. Okay. That's, that's interesting here. And another perspective there. Omar, what do you have? So we just mentioned the camps in Algeria a couple mm -hmm. of times, and we have different perspectives about what's happening there. You have Mustafa over here who's suggesting that basically people in the camps are held against their will. Says if camps in Algeria were opened and Sahrawis were free, all of them would leave for Morocco-controlled Western Sahara. But we also have a video comment here from Mohammed, who basically is in one of those camps. Let's listen to what he has to say. As a Sahara refugee, there is one thing I want to address here, which is Moroccan propaganda myth that Sahrawi are held in refugee camps against their will. The fact is that Sahrawi are in refugee camps because their country is military occupied by Morocco, and their self, uh, their right to self determination, has been denied for the last 40 years without any willingness from the international community to enable that, uh, them to exercise that right. So, Samia, you have once again this contrast between people who say they're held against their will versus people who say they don't want to go back until their self-determination. What's your take? I mean, I've been to the refugee camps twice, and there's, there's so many Sahrawis who are able to move freely within the camps and beyond, uh, beyond the country and throughout the world. Um, if there's one point to raise, it's the issue of uh, legal documentation and what documentation the refugees are able to use to travel. Um, and that varies, whether it's an identity card, whether it's an Algerian passport. Some actually have Moroccan passports, which adds another level of complexity to the issue. Um, but, yeah, but, you know, this, I, I would very much like to echo what Mohamed Salim said in his video that it's, um, I think it's used as a source of propaganda to suggest that, the, so, that refugees are being held against their will in the camps, when in fact the decision to remain really in the quick. camps is very so, much politically Ali, driven. Just give me a moment. Okay, go ahead, Ali. What sure. do you want to add? No, we, when we're talking about the camps, the way it sounds is like they can travel freely. This is not true. It's true for a caste of, of dirigent and, and, and their disciple. For the reality, most of them are not allowed to move around the camps. To move, travel from camp to camp, there is different camps. They're not freely. And I'll give you a real example of the issue in the camps. And this is a very easy question. Why is Polisario in Algeria refusing the census of the refugees in the camps? If Algeria allows the UN to go and does a real census of who lives there, at least we will know who lives in the camps. That will clarify the situation and it will give them the right to choose. Do they want to stay in the camps? Do they want to go back to their homeland? Or they can go somewhere else, like in Sweden or other countries that because are Because Ali, let, let me just to, explain to so people who, who don't know the area so well. Issue, people have been and living, they have been refusing the census. So Ali, people have been living in those refugee camps for 40 years. 40. Four yeah, exactly. zero years. Uh, Senia, you were born there. Um, can you yeah. answer that, that question that um, Ali had about Polisario and a, a census of the refugee camps? 
you know, it's it's very ironic some, uh, to to talk about the refugee camps as, uh, and the lack of free of, of movement. When I'm here, I was born and grew up there. Um, I didn't choose to be born there. Uh, my family fled, uh, you know, military occupation. They were bombarded uh, by white uh, phosphorus and Napoleon. I lost my my grandfather. My grandmother is today completely blind. She will never see the country that she saw when she was a little girl. Um, and uh, to say that we're not free to move. I'm a testament to that. I'm uh, in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. How else would I have made it here if I couldn't move? So I have just um, one question will, for you. How about Mohammed Wilde Salma, who uh, left the uh, refugee the camps and was not allowed to come back to Hindu? Uh, so, so, uh, Professor, just, just give me a moment can so we can hear you clearly. Question, please? So, so repeat that question. Can I, can I just finish, please? Can yeah. I just finish, please? Thank you. Yeah. Senia, you finish, um, Professor, the, then you pick up at the I end of Senia. I don't think anyone wishes to, to, to live in refugee camps. Uh, we are forced by uh, Morocco's occupation to be living there. Our only wish is to be allowed to exercise our right to self-determination. We're the last colony in Africa. We just want to choose. Um, we're allowed to freely choose whether we want to be an independent census. state or otherwise. And then we can decide what you know what happens. And the politics of population are, will always be there. And it's the same question would be raised how many Moroccan settlers are in the right, so territories. Senia, I, I I'm going to wrap you up there so I can bring in the professor. We only have so much time on this show. Professor, what did you want to say? Yeah, I just want to ask uh, Sanya why um, um, the, um, um, yeah, why Mohammed Wood Salma could not return to Tindouf after leaving it. And please uh, explain against, who, who Mohammed uh, is. Human rights abuses in yep. the camps. And professor, explain Why he's not still allowed to go back to uh, uh, okay. the uh, Tindouf. Can you answer to the question before uh, going off? Okay, please? Mohammed is the, the video commenter. Sanya, go ahead. Um, I, I I will not answer for someone who I don't really know their their full story and the reason for it, but I do know very well that he was allowed, like any other Sahrawis, and unfortunately many Sahrawis from the occupied territories actually, when they tried to the, come to the refugee camps and go back to the occupied territories of Western Sahara, they okay. were arrested. And yes, the yes, example yes, is a young Sahrawi who was sentenced to four years imprisonment. We're talking about a teenager. No, they have been sentenced for fact. So, Professor and Senia, we're, we're going to push on because there's, there's more to this story than refugee camps. I know they're very important, but I want to push yeah, but on. But it's important right. to know why they refuse the census. Why do, by international law, they should be allowed to allow the UN to do a census of the refugees. Sure. This is very important. I, think, I, I, hear you, I hear your point, Ali. I, I'm, I'm going to move on so that we can well cover be. a little bit more territory as, if but, we can. Go know, ahead, He's mentioning census, but there's also fingers being pointed about the lack of uh, the referendum, basically, that's been talked mm -hmm. about. We have a video comment from Sheja talking specifically about that. Let's listen to what she has to say. Sahrawi people only want a referendum. We want to decide about our future. We have been waiting for United Nations to make a referendum since 1991, and Morocco is still blocking it. There is a daily violation of human rights in the occupied territories, and the conditions in the refugee camps are really difficult. We believe in peace, but we also believe in our right to be home. So Ali Sheja says it's Morocco that's blocking this referendum from taking place. Why is that? Yeah, but I mean, even though you, we, we were talking about the U.S. census and uh, on, on the, the camps, Morocco has not refused to do the referendum. On the contrary, we were the one accepting it on the first, uh, the first time. The king of Morocco accepted it in 1981, the concept of the referendum. What it's difficult the concept, is uh, the Ali, 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 let me just, let me just check here. The, the, the issue with the referendum is that the conditions of the initial referendum were to be done based off of a census that Spain conducted. And as time goes by, the people that were included in the census are increasingly dying off. So obviously, this question of the referendum is it's not just self-determination, it's not just a census, but it's the fact that Spain has a legal that. obligation to see this conflict through, to see the resolution of this conflict through. And to this day, it has done absolutely nothing aside from sit passively and allow the, the propagation of increasing you know, nationalist uh, narratives between both sides. And the people that are suffering the most are the Sahrawis. Yeah, I, uh, Senya, I, I, I don't understand your logic. 
Uh, you say that M Morocco is blocking the uh, referenda. Morocco was uh, the first. I didn't say Morocco is uh, blocking the referendum. I said that Spain has a legal, a legal responsibility and under international to law to see the referendum through, which it has absolutely done. Tell me how tight so I can hear the You will see. Uh, you will see uh, that uh, Ali, uh, Morocco is willing to give me a moment. I can't hear anybody right problems. now. This could not be implemented on the soil because we don't know who is uh, uh, and has the ability to, uh, to vote or to give his uh, to voice his mind. Since we know that many. Uh, so-called refugees in uh, Tindouf are coming from Mauritania, are coming from Ma northern Mali, and are coming from other uh, uh, parts of the, uh, the the Sahara. I mean, the biggest Sahara, not only the, the Sahara, the Moroccan Sahara. So, who is, uh, has the ability to vote? Can you answer this question, and then we can go further in the, uh, the debate? We don't have much time, so I'm just going to bring you back here to my laptop. Here, this is Munoso the United Nations mission for the referendum in Western Sahara. This mission has been ongoing for a very long time. This referendum was supposed to be in the early 1990s. Now, for our international audience watching this, what is the issue? Why would it take so long for a referendum to happen? Ali, what's your take? Yeah. Why so long? It's not a matter of referendum. It's a matter of finding, I think even the UN is past the phase of the referendum. UN is talking today about finding a solution, yeah. a win-win solution, mutually agreed on both parts. And this is where the Moroccan proposal of autonomy was and is a very serious solution. Morocco in 2007 proposed an autonomy, a very large autonomy, that will allow the local population to run is all of the, the, the so local government. So from your perspective, uh, it's not Morocco that's stopping it things. It was considered by the UN a very credible and very right. serious proposal. So, uh, so Ali, I think well, this is where we should Ali, just give, give me a moment. So We're from your perspective, it's not Morocco is not issue. stopping this negotiation process from your, from your perspective? Not at all, not at all. Huh. If we are making a, a serious but proposal... But they're diluting the demographics with settlers in the territory. <laughs> It, to, know, to be honest, it doesn't matter how much you're diluting. If you don't have a referendum, you don't have a referendum. Well, you don't this have is a negotiation. fundamental issue. It's the oh, fact no, what do you have? So we, no, we no, have... UN is best referendum. I'm not saying we are. I'm going to come to you in just a bit, Ali, but we, we have a conversation <laughs> about the role of Algeria in this has been really big in our online mm -hmm. community. So we have Yusra over here who, say, who says, I think what you should be discussing is why Algeria spends thousands of dollars to finance the Polisario. And then we have uh, Lesson over here who says, as long as Algeria is part of the conflict, the issue will last for many years to come. Uh, Sania, what is your take on Algeria's role? How do you respond to people who say that Algeria is part of the problem here? Um, uh, the problem here is, unfortunately, that there has been no implementation of the, the agreed decision on holding the referendum of self-determination, something that the United Nations and international law, we're talking about an issue that actually existed so since Sania, 63. Just, just, when take, was just take, a, take a pause for a moment. More, the role of Algeria in this was what Omar asked you, and your response is yes. what? Yeah. The only role that Algeria ho uh, has is that it, it's hosting the refugees in its territory. That's that, it? Uh, when, when we were bombarded by, right. uh, by our both neighbors, Morocco and Mauritania, our only uh, exit f for safety was, unfortunately, na our neighboring country, Algeria. Where's and Algeria the way forward, has always Senia? supported liberation uh, we, We've movement. been hearing the bouncing back and forward about the debate and and who has ownership and who should be able to vote and, and censors, et cetera. What's the way forward? Um, the, the way forward is quite uh, quite straightforward and easy. We're talking about a fundamental basic right to for us to choose what we want to choose our fate, and for the uh, for Morocco to allow that to happen, for its for its allies like the France and the United States to allow that to be mm -hmm. implemented, and um, for the international community to really push Morocco to to ensure that this um, uh, referendum of self determination right, let me, let me does just happen. Let with the professor. That's let the only. It's Pro as, as basic okay, as that. All right, let me just check in with the professor. Professor, just very briefly, what's the way forward from here, from this point on? Uh, first, I have to react to the role of Algeria in this conflict. I have uh, uh, conflict one minute, professor, so I, I would love to hear the way forward, and then we can do that, talk about Algeria in our post-show, which we're heading to in just a moment. The way forward, just briefly, would be what? Uh, I cannot hear you well if you could just... Uh, sure. Um, I mean, Let's uh, focus on the way forward and then we'll talk about Algeria more in yes, our yes. online post show when we've got a little bit more time. The way forward would be what, Professor? So, what was the question? Ali? Yes, I, uh, for me it's very easy. If both sides put the 
human being in the middle of the solution, we find a solution. Okay, good. Morocco has started doing that by making the autonomy proposal. Mm. It did not stay frozen on its initial position. It's moving forward. It's gaining ground to a common area where we can find a solution. Unfortunately, Algeria is not allowing the Polisario to freely decide for their future. All right. I'm sure if enough right, so international pressure is put on Algeria... You're listening to Ali. We also have Samia and Senia and Professor Machine. Could we even talk about this entire Western Sahara disputed area? in half an hour. There's so much more to talk about in the post show at stream.aljazeera.com. Hopefully you can join us. Thanks for watching. Hello, it's good to have you back. Welcome to the Streams Online Post Show. Let's get right back to our conversation. Professor Machine, I'm sorry you couldn't quite hear me when I was asking you about um, the way forward, but I know you particularly wanted to talk about Algeria and Algeria's role in this dispute. What do you want to add? Yeah, if the international opinion uh, don't know what negative role Algeria is playing um, uh, in, the, uh, in this conflict, Nobody will understand worldwide why this 40-year uh, uh, long um, conflict is still enduring and why the Sahrawi are the victims of the Algerian, uh, I mean, um, the Algerian government and military, and they insist and they insist on the military of Algeria playing in this uh, conflict because we don't have to, uh, I mean, to understand what happened in 1963. Uh, during the, the, the Sand War, and what followed after to know why Algeria is taking this uh, uh, conflict as a, a, a nation pride and wanting to uh, like to tackle the Moroccan efforts to modernize and to develop uh, the kingdom, of course, and the Sarkran provinces as well. This is what um, I had uh, to say on this point. So, how we could we move forward? Uh, I, I think that it, Algeria should, we... uh, I mean, um, um, like, let the Sahrawi people to decide for themselves. And I'm sure that the Sahrawi are not all um, have the same I, I sense. I think we're, we're, Some we're, of them we're are pro Polisario and the others are pro Moroccan. So let's organize for a moment. Senia, 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 I hear you. Just hold tight for a moment. And to decide whether there will be like a tail into to Algeria or uh, free people living all their land in dignity and in uh, um, uh, welfare. Now you have time to speak, Celia. Um, yeah, <laughs> you, no, I, you didn't I, join I, in. I Go think, ahead. I think we're 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 going away from the the main conflicted parties here. Yeah. The 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 conflict is between the Kingdom of Morocco and the Polisario. Algeria has nothing, absolutely nothing, to do with it, and uh, we can't run away from the fact that um, the the suffering of the Sahrawis in the refugee camps, including myself, are um, are worsened by the fact that uh, our country rich in natural resources and those natural resources being exploited by Moroccan. Uh, occupation the the right that uh, that it does not have um they do not have under international law um and um i grew up stunted you know malnourished anemic um and the same are with my siblings we're talking about malnutrition anemia pre, you know prevalent in the refugee camps yeah, and uh, our our um, our uh, our territory, you know, being very rich in natural resources, including uh, f fish, and I receive canned fish from uh, donated from Sweden when tons and tons of fish are being uh, stolen from the coast of uh, of Western Sahara. And right now, Morocco is drilling for oil, which will make it even more complicated. Something that clearly Morocco does not have the right to exploit or, or steal. Um, and uh, the 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 only reason that this is uh, prolonged is because Morocco has the immunity of uh, international actors like France and the United States. Sunny, um, I, I, you brought up the international community here. I know that's Oma, you wanted to pick up there. Go ahead. That's right. We have people who are talking about it. We have Jira over here online who says the UN is not acting seriously. International interests in our natural resources, the French veto, and Morocco has powerful friends are all reasons why this is not being taken seriously. And then you have Intercity Press over here who says there is one question that has not been asked. What's the role of France, including banning human rights monitoring by the UN mission in, uh, in Western Sahara. 
Samia, what's your take on this particular issue of the UN mission and the role of the international community generally in not pushing harder for resolving the issue? Well, it's unfortunate this is the only UN mission that doesn't have a human rights monitoring mandate. That's and this true. is something that activists have been lobbying for. And it's something that would be at the best interest of both sides of the conflict. So, Sami, let me just ask you this. And Ali, Ali, you said true, yes, too. So, true. So, so, so hold tight here. Look here on my laptop. This is Minoso. United Nations Mission for the Referendum in Western Sahara. Why should you have a human rights mandate when you're just there to set up a referendum? That would be bizarre, wouldn't it? You're there to do a vote. But one of the fundamental issues that is inciting... Nobody <laughs> knew they'd be there for more than a decade. I mean, well, that's the issue. And if they knew they were going to be there for a long time, I get it. But they were just there to do a referendum. Why would you critique them for that? I mean, you could critique them for a lot of other things, but, but not for the fact they were just setting up a referendum. Well, because the issue is that there has been a lot of reason for the stagnation of this conflict, and one of that has been human rights abuses on both sides. So including a human rights monitoring mechanism will allow uh, transparency, to come to, transparency to come through. But not to mention, I mean, international law, if we're going to talk about international law here, international mechanisms, I want to go back to my point that Spain has... You made that point many times. Yeah. We get that. It's, we have it. I got it. Point. It's seared in my brain. <laughs> got it. Moving on. Uh, yep. uh, um, yeah, Minorso no, yeah, uh, has failed possible? to achieve its principal, its principal role, which, as you rightfully said, is to organize a referendum on yeah. self-determination. Simple, just one well, thing. Uh, referendum. It, very simple, right? Very simple. It has Not failed miserably. So it has been now for 24, mm. 24 years, um, and it hasn't achieved that. So while they are dragging on that process, where serious human rights violations are being committed against Sahrawi okay. civilians by Moroccan authorities right. in the occupied uh, and also I, I get that. So the least you make a good point. I, I want to move on because we're running that. out of time here. So once you start repeating your points, I'm going to push you on a little bit. Ali, what did you want to say? No, I had to say every time we bring up the Tindouf camps and the horrible situation and the Algeria responsibility, we go again running into other subjects. We have to put, when I say we have to put the human people on the middle of this issue, mm. we cannot accept for 40 years that Algeria is keeping in camps people living in horrible condition. And I've been to the camps. I'm one of the few Moroccans that have been there and I've seen it's terrifying the situation and they're I've living in. I've been to the camps as well. Algeria <laughs> needs to take responsibility. In 40 years, they could not afford to give them regular housing. I'm not asking for five-star housing, but at least a minimum with water and electricity. We'll just look at the if images and the footage really of the flooding that has devastated the refugees. Right. So, Aya, I'm going to do, do what you criticize us of doing in this conversation is noted, moving on. I'm really intrigued about this sure, UN. Human right. I yeah. have to go back to human right. Yeah, absolutely. Minnesota was done for two, two reasons. Yeah. One was the referendum, and one was, and you, we keep forgetting that, is the ceasefire. The main role today of the Minnesota is to keep the ceasefire. We forget that in 91, the agreement were a peace agreement to sure. stop the war. Yeah, yeah. So the main role today of Minerso is uh, to st uh, stop. Uh, of I, course, I, I think we could probably all spirit. agree that their, their, their role has probably changed over the years. The world does not have human, uh, human right watch. Sure. There are six other in the world UN missions that do not have that. And I can give you the examples. You don't need to because also, I'm moving on. Ali, hold yeah. tight for a moment. And Senia as well. Omar, go so ahead. He was just talking, Ali was just talking about the ceasefire. And we have a related note here from Sida Ahmed who says, Morocco has made this conflict getting so long by not accepting the referendum in order to benefit from the resources of Western Sahara. Goes on to say, going back to war is the only option left for the Polisario Front to resolve the dispute over Western Sahara. Uh, Professor Mohsen, what do you think are the yeah. prospects of actually going back to military conflict at this stage? Uh, well, first, I have to mention that um, for $7 spent uh, in uh, Western Moroccan Sahara, um, six are coming from uh, the uh, public uh, budget and not coming from uh, local resources, as has been said by your EVP. Um, so Morocco is investing in the southern provinces to make a better life for uh, his citizens. And uh, so saying that they are just spoiling this these resources is not true. So um, as for your, uh, your question, I think that we need to look for the future. We don't have to look to, into the past and uh, cripple on uh, the uh, uh, present situation. To look for the future is uh, the, the region and the world is shaped by global terrorism, by uh, a global fear, 
And uh, I don't think that dividing uh, states into but the question minor about states war will help is really, really in important. any uh, way uh, the uh, security in the region. We the need to bring about war is together to talk we have and to, to understand that people uh, are being pushed to, design to really so, Professor, do you, do you, do you hear, do you hear one yeah. more, Professor? Uh, I mean, uh, Professor Massine? Minor state Professor Massine? Professor Massine, do you hear what Senia just said to you? Go ahead, I think people are really uh, are, are being pushed to the option of war. Uh, we've fought for 24 years now peacefully, and uh, people like myself, gener the young generation, were extremely frustrated with the uh, with the stalemate and the lack of progress. So our only option is really to return to war, and there is no one at fault more than Morocco. That's why we have to go back to what Peter Van Walsom said, the U.S. envoy, before Mr. Ross, who said clearly... So do we want to see more bloodshed? Is that what we want to see? Solution. We need to find a middle ground solution. If I say... There is no middle the ground. Cast, the running cast for Polisario, such as yourself, that can travel and have the luxury to travel and live a better life in, in different countries, are not the ones suffering, like the one in the camps and the one in the southern part of Morocco, who have families in the camps. We need to put the people in the middle of our understanding and our reflection. If the leadership... I agree that we should put the, put the humans at the center. I agree that. Solution, I and that is a good point for us to wrap up on for this part of the conversation. When Senia and Ali say, I agree, that's a good place to pause. So I'm going to say thank you to Samia and Ali and Senia and Professor Machine for helping us uh, hear the diversity of opinions in this conversation and this debate. I don't want it to be 40 years before something happens. Um, I wish you all the best as you work on this very tricky situation. Omar, what do you have? I'll leave you with a debate that is actually still going on online. Sida Ahmed says, I think that if France would stop using its veto, Western Sahara would be independent by now. But Noama responds by saying, just don't dream about it. We Sahrawis will never be anything except Moroccan. Thank you, guests. Really appreciate your takes today. Take care, everybody.